Yeah, so um, thanks for joining. Um, okay. Um, so yes, as I say, I'm Richard. I'm going to talk through the, uh, our, our experience of, um, of, of disaggregation at an internet exchange. I'm actually going to go through today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is an internet exchange, because maybe not all of you uh, are, are familiar with uh, what we do. Um, I'm going to then go into a little bit about the, the, the background and the detail of the technology that we chose to deploy, and then talk through the journey um, and, and try and spe share with you some of the, uh, the, the, the good and the bad of what we, what we learned along the way uh, about trying to adopt this type of, type of platform for links. And then, um, and then I just conclude with um, what we think for the market it means as far as in the context of internet exchanges and um, open to questions. Um, I will say, I know there's a section at the end for the questions, but if you've got, it's a pr pretty, pretty small room, so if, if, you wanna, if, you, if you've got a question as we go, put your hand up and we can stop. Um, I'm pretty flexible on that. So, okay. So, what is links? Um, anybody, anybody peering at an internet exchange? Yes, one. Excellent, excellent. Well, so um, London Internet Exchange is probably one of the oldest uh, internet exchanges in the world. Um, so, we were founded in 1994 um, out of the objective of keeping traffic local. So, this was at the time where the internet was predominantly um, had, had, well managed and connected out of the US, um, it, out of UK, US government and, and US universities, uh, five founding companies for Links came together, U, UK ISPs, and said, look, you know, we need to have a, a, a local presence in the UK where we can, we can exchange traffic without having to send it all the way over to the US and back. And, um, and they teamed together and created a, a not-for-profit mutual organization called the London Internet Exchange. And those five, five founding um, members um, and, and, uh, have stuck with us, and we've grown since then. And we're now around about 800, 820 uh, members. So I will, I will uh, jump between the terminology of members and customers as we, as we go through the presentation today. We are still uh, a non-for-profit uh, membership organization. From that point of view, we do we do strive to make a profit, but because our members are effectively our shareholders, the way that we return value to shareholders is by constantly reducing our, our port fees year on year, so that, that effectively the, the, the profit that we make is returned to shareholders through um, price, price port reductions. Uh, we're one of three, probably the three largest internet exchanges in the world, um, the other two being the DKICS, the German-based organization, and AMSIX, which is the Amsterdam organization, and, and links uh, us three are probably the, the longest established and, and, and most significant. Our customers, so our, our goal is to bring together networks locally uh, for exchange of platforms, so our customers are content providers, access providers, internet exchange points, autonomous systems that can come together, use our infrastructure to interconnect, and create peer in sessions and obviously exchange exchange traffic. Uh, what do our networks look like? They're, they're, they're traditionally metro wide, so we've got um, Manchester, Scotland, uh, I'll go into a bit more detail where our presence are, but s typically our networks sit within the metro um, and, and they interconnect a, a geography that's somewhere between you know two, three kilometers and, and in, in the case of London, huge, it goes all the way to Slough, it's about 60, 65 kilometers. So that's a typ typical metro, con metro connection. Um, we're now running around uh, our customers or our members can connect 80% of the global internet routing table. We connect about 25 terabits of, of capacity across, across the London metros uh, and we see a peak traffic around 4.5, 4.6 terabits of traffic as, as you go through the, uh, through, through, through the day. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, uh, a feel for the size, what we do. Um, we're, we're, we partner with data centers, so we don't run our own data centers, but we partner with, our, with data centers and we're, we're present in around 20 data centers globally providing our services. Okay. So let's focus on London. Um, the one that I'm going to talk about today is, is we'll come into the detail, is London 2. So we have two dual, dual platforms in London, um, for, for purely for diversity, so that our, our customers can connect to London 1 and London 2 and have that resiliency between the two. As I say, we, London is a huge geography. For those that don't know it, um, the, 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 on the east is what we class as Docklands. Um, this is where a lot of the um, international submarine cables end up, you know, um, routing up through the UK and terminating 
in, in, in the Docklands area. Um, but it stretches now, it stretches all the way over to the west, which is a place called Slough. Um, and so that span is around 65 kilometers from east to west. And we have some cable systems that run from the uh, east coast of America that comes into, into Slough. And it's, you know, Slough obviously has a, a time latency -ish, um, a benefit for, for, for US connectivity. Um, we also work with Interaction um, and Telehouse and Digital Realty, as well as Equinix in, in that London metro. Uh, say 12 different locations of which um, we, 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 we take space off of these, these partners and, and we deploy our networks and interconnect um, those 25 terabits of capacity. So London 2 infrastructure. Um, well, what's the background? So at the time this started, and I've got a bit of a timeline that we will go through um, a, a little bit later, but at the time um, we were around 700 members. I think we're about 800, just over 800 now. Um, so so we, we were sitting there with, with back in 2016, um, where we needed to revamp the London 2 infrastructure. We were running extreme networks at the time, so we had a deployment of the uh, Black Diamond BDX8 uh, equipment, uh, and it got to a point where capacity was growing and you know, uh, extreme weren't really heading in the direction of, of at, the, at that time of, of uh, 100 gig high density line cards. Um, so we went out to tender and we went out through the usual process of talking to the, the main network providers. Um, uh, traditional switch providers uh, and, and said look you know can you you know give us a price this is the this is what, what we're, we're looking at um, we also went to sort of the more merchant silicon integrated suppliers you know those that take the Broadcom um, silicon but, but badge it in their in their switches I think the, the last presentation or the one before I actually went through some of those um, and then we started to talk to uh, to, to the, the the white box players and, and our, our first port of call was with the edge core networks. And, and it was really when we, we started to explore uh, what is now obviously this disaggregated solution and, and open compute. But at the time, we were, we were talking with edge core networks um, and, and just exploring the concept of, you know, can we build a next generation network out of, out of these, the, these type of devices. And it seemed, you know, the whole ecosystem was very immature at that time, so it seemed a bit risky. Um, but you know, we were we were you know pretty excited by the by the idea. Um, we're a tech tech led company, so um, you know once once we get given a challenge, as I'm sure many of you in the room, you know, we like to like to think we can engineer and solve solve most things. So we we were quite quite intrigued by um, going down this route. But really, I mean, what what you know what benefits you know it it, it had for us was you know huge savings on, on capital investment, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of saving on, on um, operational costs, so the support cost of, of running this stuff, and, and space and power. So we're, we are very, um, you know, we have a great partnership with the data centers, but we're very reliant on good contractual agreements with them to get uh, a certain amount of space and a certain amount of power so that we can put presence in these data centers to make, make sure that we can put our networks in there. Um, we have the dual challenge of trying to grow the network, but at the same time trying to trying to manage our, our space and our power. So, so this this obviously was a, a, was a, a key thing for us as well. So in the end, we decided we did. We got to the point in 2016, uh, towards the end, towards the end there, where where we said, look, actually, we think we can we can make this work um, with with uh, EdgeCore, uh, and then EdgeCore. Um, I think at the time had their own net network operating system. Um, for, for, um, some, some, I, I think it, we tested the, their, their operating system, but we quickly moved to a, a recommendation that they found for us, which was IP Infusion. So IP Infusion are the people that the, they, they make the, their, their product is called Ocnos, and they make the network operating system that runs on the edge core, edge core devices. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about, you know, some of the some of the uh, complexities around that, some of the challenges. But that ho hopefully that gives you a feel. So we got to this point in 2016 where we said, hey, you know, this looks like it's viable. It looks like we could do something with this. Whilst we wanted to move away from extreme networks, we weren't in a position where it was, you know, it was on fire. It was you know, we were having to rush. We had infrastructure in place. We had assets that we were we 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 were capable of delivering services over, but we just didn't have. Um, scale and, and we certainly didn't have the, the ability to grow that at, at a decent cost base. So, um, as I say, we decided to go with EdgeCore Networks. Um, they, they're owned by Acton, and, and EdgeCore you know, is, is, is 
one of their, their go-to-market uh, in interfaces. Um, we then partnered with IP Infusion, and it really was the three links, IP Infusion and EdgeCore, working together. And I'm going to go through the, you know, the, the, how we tested and uh, how, we, how we managed that, because it, it, it was a big step from, from what we traditionally do. Um, just to give you a feel for what, what we, we normally would do is on, on our London One network, we partner with Juniper. And I'm sure many of you have worked with Juniper Networks. Um, fantastic um, equipment, um, very, very reliable. You, you know, you could say quite expensive for what, what we need in the Internet Exchange. You know, if you look at the MX960, which we've invested in, it's a, it's a multi-service platform and, and it does, you know, the Junos and, and the MX960 is fantastic. But it probably does a little bit more than what we need at an Internet Exchange, but it, 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 there's certain features of what we need that we, 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 we rely on. But, you know, with Juniper comes a huge backlog of support and, and proof of concept testing that, that you rely on. Um, you know, we're moving down this ro route, um, we, we were moving into, into new territories where you don't get that same sort of support that, uh, from, from a, a big in incumbent like Juniper that maybe Edgecore and IP Infusion um, have. So we also chose that we wanted to go for eVPN. Um, this was quite important for an internet exchange. So internet exchanges is a distributed ethernet, uh, effectively a, you know, a wide area ethernet switch, you know, uh, merge, you know, sort of spread over 65 kilometers. It is a layer two broadcast domain. So there's a lot of, there is a lot of flooding, there's a lot of noise. Um, so we use a, an MPLS VPLS solution today. We wanted to go for eVPN because eVPN uses uh, multi-protocol BGP as a, as a way of passing information about the MAC addresses around. So effectively, there becomes a synchronized table of MAC addresses that is communicated, um, and, and it takes all of that broadcast traffic away from, uh, away from the forwarding plane. So it means that the, the network is much more stable. For, for an internet exchange, it's, it, it's a fantastic solution. Um, but EVPN again was a, a, an emerging technology, and, and I'll go through some of the challenges we had with IP Infusion. At the time when we decided to go for this, EVPN hadn't actually been developed for, for OCNOS with, with I, IP Infusion. Um, so hence, uh, if, if we were successful, we would be the first internet ex exchange point in the world to adopt uh, this disaggregated approach with eVPN, um, so it makes it it makes it interesting, but it also makes it a a, a little bit risky um, and and causes a few few sleepless nights as we went went through this. So we needed to grow. We need we knew that you know the internet uh, our, our our customers continue to uh, put more and more traffic onto us. Um, some of that's mitigated within network caching from the big content guys, but still, you know, whilst we don't see the same data growth as as maybe the you know the the the, the content and social media guys, we certainly see increasing uh, traffic content year on year uh, over our internet infrastructure. Um, we, we needed to, to challenge the traditional model. Um, we're under pressure to reduce our port prices year on year. Uh, we're under pressure to grow our, our capacity. Um, and you know, if you're increasing, increasing capacity and reducing prices, um, you know, that puts a squeeze on, on you know, how, how you deliver those services. So we, you know, we had to challenge the traditional model. Um, we had to look at how we, how we increase capacity, as I say, 100 gig plus, and we expect 400 gig to be, be, be coming soon. For, for our customers. And so we felt you know, there was enough maturity and momentum around open networking that we, we, we could entertain that. Um, but it was going to be a, a real challenge for us. So a little bit more about the new, te the, the new technologies. Um, we, we went for, so just to, you know, because we were really wanting to challenge ourselves, we, we, we were going for eVPN, we were going for disaggregation, and we decided to change the architecture as well. So rather than have a, a traditional metro ring architecture, we, 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 we adopted the, uh, the leaf and spine um, model, which obviously, obviously is typical to, to the in data center approach. Um, where we could, where we could take, um, we could take a, 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 a basically a, a, a leaf and spine architecture over over nine data centers and spread spread it out so that we that we could adopt this this uh, more granular approach to to the way that we build networks. I mean, you know, that why is that the right architecture? I think we heard from a, a presentation a little bit earlier today. If you're in the room. It is a balance when you go to multi-slot chassis. It's a balance between, you know, the the, the fabric, you know, uh, putting in large switches with fabric cards versus the optics and interconnecting the leaf and spines. So I think for the size of the network that we were we had in, in question with um, with London Two, leaf and spine worked out from a cost point of view. 
Um, you know, we're, as I say, we're very conscious of cost and we'll continue to look at the optics and the interconnect cost of the leaf and spine model on a, on a single slot um, type, type chassis. But, you know, uh, we'll move to a multi-slot chassis if, if and when uh, as, as needed. But so we went down this leaf and spine approach and I've got a network diagram that I'll show a little bit later just to show that distribution. But it's no different to what you, you would see from many of the presentations today and, and over, over the, the last two days about uh, a spine, uh, a set of spine switches that then link into a set of leaf and switches and each leaf switch has got a role to play whether it's connecting at 1 gig, 10 gig, 100 gig or whether it's a, a connection to another data centre uh, in, in, in the London metro. Um, we don't, uh, even though our switches do support 40 gig, uh, we don't have members um, asking for connections at 40 gig. It's, it's traditionally 1, 10 and 100 uh, and if they want 40 gig they take 4 times 10 and they lag them together and provide a, a, a virtualized pipe at 40 gig. Um, the disaggregated approach, why did we think that this was a good idea? Um, well, it, I, think, I think really cost. Um, it, it really comes down to flexibility and cost. You know, we like the idea that we can break apart the ecosystem. We look at the data center interconnected platform. Uh, we look at the optics, the transmission network. We look at the, the Ethernet switches, the, uh, the operating system, and we write some um, software ourselves. So we have a team of software engineers that write applications to integrate the links systems and, and uh, fulfillment software into the, into the network itself. So, so we like the idea of the disaggregated approach. It gives us much more flexibility. We think as we go through over the next two, three, four years, um, we will be able to upgrade uh, components within that ecosystem uh, more strategically. And we believe that you know, over time it's going to save us uh, a, a lot of money as well. Um, why EVPN? I think I went into that. Uh, I went into that in a little bit of detail just on the on the last slide. Um, it's an emerging technology, really suited to a distributed Ethernet um, environment. Uh, it, it, it is the right technology for any IXP or, or similar type network. Um, we, um, you know, we we've got it in and it's working and it's it, it's fantastic. It's it, it's complete. You know, for for you know, you can imagine if you're a hundred gig customer on the platform and you've got a load of noisy traffic going on, it's not it's not a huge impact on you. But if you're a one gig customer and you, and you've got all of this, you know, terabits of traffic going on and there's noise and broadcasts and chats from the network, um, it can have a severe Im impact on your on your service. A lot of our customers are voice over IP distribution networks. And so you can imagine broadcast traffic has, has a, a huge impact on them. It also gives us the ability to do things like multi-homing as well um, for redundancy across different, different sites and different, different data centers. Um, I think, I think you know, for us, the, the, the reliability, the third point there is about service availability and service quality. Um, our customers, they rely on the, the internet has to be up all the time. Um, we provide service to service providers, so telcos, ISPs, uh, content players are all our customers, and they expect our platform to be resilient, robust, uh, high quality, and, and, and uh, always there. Um, a little bit of detail about EVPN. I mentioned this about the BGP. Um, so it uses, it takes the MAC address uh, and it uses the BGP protocol, which is obviously BGP is well trusted, especially across the internet, um, eBGP and IBGP for communicating. It takes, uh, it takes that control uh, element in, of, of passing the MAC addresses around the network. So effectively, every single endpoint, all of our customers, all the reachable MAC addresses are programmed uh, and updated uh, real time into the network. So there is no uncertainty. It's predictable, it's stable. There's, there's you know, failures um, mean that relearning is, is done through control signals rather than through broadcast over the, uh, the, the data and forwarding plane. And as I say, it offers this flexibility around multi-homing. I mean, multi-homing, does exist in, in, in MPLS deployments on certain platforms, but it's, it's, it's not been very well deployed, um, and certainly not on an internet exchange. 
Uh, on eVPN, it's, it's one of the features that's been designed from the ground up. Um, a lot of our customers, I say, will come to us and say, look, we want to take 200 uh, or two, two times 10 gig. Um, I want them bundled together. If we want to give re redundancy between those physical connections, it has to be done on the same end device, the same provider edge device. Um, EVPN gives us the ability to split those two across two devices or even two sites, but still virtualize that pipe into 20 gig. Obviously, if one of the sites fails, it reduces the capacity by 50%. So let's talk a little bit about the process that we um, that we went through um, and and the timeline. Um, so um, we're a membership organisation, so we're very transparent to our customer base. We sat down um, actually in 2016. It was when we first started to speak to to the various. You know, when we went out to RFP and we we started to in, engage with EdgeCore. Um, we at the end of 2000. 16, we actually went back to the membership. So we went to a number of our key customers and said, look, we're thinking about going down this, this approach. What do you think? Um, and we spoke, you know, some of the, some of the, many of the, you know, the, 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 the people that will be, be here today um, will, will, were part of that consultation. So big content guys, social media guys. Um, and we had really good support for that. So it kind of gave us the confidence as we went into 2017 that there was support that our customers would stick with us through this journey. And so we went into testing phase and we, we went through some testing first with EdgeCore and then as I say they brought IP Infusion into the mix and we went went quickly through this test phase into a proof of concept but we had to we had to say to IP Infusion we need eVPN and so their engineers went off and started to try and test this. And you can run eVPN over a number of mechanisms and the one that we went for originally was MPLS. And we run into some blockers, and it was no no real it was no real fault. You know what we've anyone's fault. I mean, what you've got to take into consideration is we we as links are the experts in what an IXP should be doing. Um, IP Infusion have got the software, EdgeCore have got the hardware, but buried in that hardware is the Broadcom chipset. So we actually need communication and discussion across. Broadcom, EdgeCore, IP Infusion, and Links to really understand the challenges and the solution. And so we went down this MPLS route, and we realized that you know quite early early on in the proof of concept that we ran into some scaling issues around how how the IP Infusion software talks to talks to um, talks to the uh, the Broadcoms. Now that's only in the Links case, so don't take that as as as, a, as an issue with with uh, the, you know the, the overall solution. This is very specific to the way that Links builds um, builds our, our, our network uh, and, and the, the nature of it. Um, we stopped and we said, look, why don't we go for VXLAN? And so we then, you know, all that work that we'd done on, on MPLS, we then went back and said, we need to keep eVPN, but we'll run it over an IP VXLAN um, overlay. Um, that was then tested out, proof of concept. Um, we were so confident, we actually started to reduce prices and pass on some of the savings to the members during during the project before it even even went live which for me was a, a scary thing because once you know you pass on those savings you you kind of have to make it work um, we we got through 2017 as we come towards the end of 2017 we got final software from from IP infusion and we were we were really pleased um, but we had to test the GA code and go through a number of proof uh, like uh, lab testing and it was a new approach. So we have um, IP Infusion have their software developers in Bangalore. Um, EdgeCore have labs in Taiwan. Uh, Links have labs in London. Um, and, and we had to have all three facilities linked together, all three sets of engineers communicating and going through a number of discussions. And, and it, you know, it was challenging, but it was also quite rewarding. We, we, uh, we struck very good relationships with, with both partner companies. Um, we were very open and transparent with each other about um, problems and failures and, and fixes and solutions. And there was, you know, everybody had the shared vision of making this work. And, and so there was a, there was a real uh, momentum around that. So we got to a point towards the end of 2017 where we had this GA code. There was a couple of little bugs that we found, um, but we fixed them over the sort of December, January time. We started Jan January, December, deploying EdgeCore switches into our network. Um, and we were live from a uh, network platform point of view around March 
2018. We interconnected the old and the new network. We put a network to network interface and NNI connection between them. And when we were happy that that was stable, bugs were fixed, the, the edge core platforms were embedded and running for two, three months, we then started to move, move customers over. So that migration phase was around about March, April, May uh, this year. We, we completed the migrations in, in, at the end of May and we classed the network as fully operational from June because that's when we disconnected the NNI, ripped out the, the extreme network kit and, um, and had everything running 100% on the new platform. So this has been live now since, since June. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's had you know, failures, um, you know, thankfully, uh, not many hardware failures, but more you know fiber fiber issues or, or you know um, underlying muxes or, or uh, transmission problems where we've had to invoke redundancy. We've obviously had member customer uh, failure issues, and, and and the network has been extremely robust. The eVPN solution has been fantastic, and 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 the stability of the edge core platform or the edge core devices has been has been well what we expected has been has been extremely extremely good for us. Uh, a quick look at the network, um, you know, just to give you an idea here, I mean, you, you know, these, these slides will be available. They're not all devices are shown, so some of these devices in the, in the more gray boxes are actually, you know, four, five, six uh, LEAF devices. But we use a combination of the 58 and 7700 um, series uh, boxes from EdgeCore. We use, you, you probably can spot there, Sienna um, Wave Server to interconnect the data centers at uh, n times 100 gig. And then uh, we break into a traditional leaf and spine um, with, with the, the, uh, the spines connecting multiple leaf device, uh, devices that run 1, 1, 10, and 100 gig. And, and I think we're across nine or 10 data centers for London 2 on, on the larger London 1 network. Um, we connect all 12, 12 data centers together. Um, so I'd just like to conclude then uh, the last last few minutes just with you know what does this mean in the marketplace um, and when it's a marketplace this is really for um, how we see the internet uh, IXP market and and maybe some some maybe you know other service providers so you know uh, Lynx is a service provider uh, and we got we we kind of sit in between the data center and the wide area so we 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 are embedded in the data centers but we interconnect them as well. So we are a service provider. We are a little bit more like a, a you know a telco type, type approach, and so I think you know this technology does have a have have a, a great impact for for us, um, but also for our customers. So, as I say, we, we are one of the top internet exchanges in the world. So we've been invited to to present on this um, this technology solution at, at IXP events around around Europe and around the world, and so we're we're delivering the message that this this type of approach. Can work, does work. Um, it's, it is a solution for IXPs. Um, London Two itself is smaller than the the larger, its larger sort of brother, the the London One network. That's the one that's still uh, running the Juniper service. But it, it proves, and it proves to Juniper, it proves to, to the, the traditional players that they need to they need to do something about you know how how they respond to this because obviously we've proved this technology works well and it works well at scale. Uh, and works well at complexity. Um, so you know what you know what does that mean as far as London One? Well, you know we'll we'll continue to work with our partners on that, but certainly something needs to needs to to give. As I say, the traditional way of doing IXP build and and, and uh, Ethernet uh, network design um, has to change from a cost point of view. Our our customers, I mentioned this throughout the the journey, the smaller networks that connect to us, the one ten. Um, gig connections, they see benefit because they see reduced noise and, and, and background traffic. The larger networks, the tens, multi tens, and hundred gig and four hundred gigs, um, they get a great great benefit through the cost of scale, flexibility, you know, capacity planning, all of that stuff. You know, the, the space, the cost of uh, of power in space, all of that gets passed on to our membership because we are essentially a membership organization, as I said at the beginning, if we're making a lot of profit out of this network, we will reduce our prices and pass that back to our customers as shareholder return, return value. Um, and that's really it where I get to just, just on, on, you know, what does it mean in the market? I think, you know, change, you know, certainly within the IXP industry, change is, is definitely coming. Um, this is, let's say, the first, you know, large scale internet exchange that's, that's approached this. Um, and and you know, we're we're very happy with 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 its, the way it's gone. It has been difficult at times, 
Um, if I was to say what's you know what's the the best way to mitigate that is you know pick the right partners, work very close, and and be very clear on the end vision, and 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 um, you know it's it enjoy the journey even if it does cause you a few headaches along the way. Um, but yeah, it's been fantastic, and as I say now I think we are up for any questions. So uh, if you have questions, uh, just even though it's a small room uh, and you can just talk with the speaker, uh, we're recording this, so uh, please use the microphone. So. Hi. Uh, on your laptop, I know there's a couple of stickers. Are you uh, looking into that as well? Are you looking to see if you can move to a P4 programmable uh, internet exchange? or? <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, this this was this was as I say, the ecosystem is changing. Um, so this this is the first uh, you know first first phase. You know, we we we've been live for six months. I think all of the engineers are taking a bit of a breather. We're, we're traveling around a few events and presenting and and, and talking. Um, you know, we we work predominantly with EdgeCore at the moment, and and you know we've got a great partnership with them. They themselves, you know, we we will say to them, well, what is your roadmap? You know, what are you investing in? Are you looking at other um, chip, chip suppliers within your switch base, and can we test them? Um, we don't have a huge number of engineers, so we rely on those th those type of partnerships to really leverage that. But yes, I mean, you know, Broadcom, we we have a relationship with uh, Barefoot. We, we're starting to talk to them, um, but you know, we would you know, understand the technology and then probably go to EdgeCore and say, look, how can you help us realize? You know, can we get benefit from that? Here's another sticker for your. Oh, laptop. okay. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Cumulus. Yes. <laughs> Other questions. Uh, so first is a clarification question. So uh, I, I, I hear you mention MPLS VPN and BGP VPN. So uh, which one are you running actually? Are you running MPLS at all or not? No. So so if we go back to we go back to the um, the eVPN. Um, we so we originally were going to run MPLS just as a as a as a transport so so to, to you know to to connect to, uh, all the devices together but the way that we the way that we would have to um, have to run that with multiple labels meant that scaling um, the way that we peeled back the labels per device on on per switch the scaling when you look at how many network devices there's I think you know this is a simplified diagram I think we've got about 50 60 devices in the network the, the scaling became became an issue with that so we've just gone to a, a, a pure IP VXLAN um, base base design with eVPN run over it. So the BGP mm -hmm. is actually multi-protocol BGP that then passes information about the MAC addresses within okay. within the signal. So you're not running MPS inside the car at all? No, no. Whereas you know, we, we still want the other network, the London One network, we still want to convert that from VPLS to eVPN and we probably will look at can we run eVPN over MPLS because we, we've already got that that underlay that you know in place. But um, you know we'll evaluate I mean that comes down to how we how our automation systems talk to the different network components as there's, there's a lot you know about you know what, what we end up doing with that design right. but on that network no it's not no, no MPS on that particular network on London too. and uh, I presume you're not running any optical recovery mechanism as well no it's pure point to point it's just uh, coherent and running multiple hundred gig point to point if it goes down it goes down it's it's yeah it's, it's a least start fiber we like the channels um, different different wavelengths and we just run multiple coherent um, connections over it. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, we would like to know um, how much has changed your operational model from, from the Juniper uh, way of operating to this new way of hardware from one vendor, software from another one, and also the training, how you have trained your, your staff, your teams, your engineers. Thank you. Yes, I mean that's a good question because that, that's that's probably been the you know one of the biggest learning curves. Um, you know, as far as what's changed, we 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 had already gone. So you know, what we love about Juniper is it's it's really programmable. So we'd already we'd already written some internal software that takes our customer inventory and pushes through uh, Ansible playbooks, pushes code out to the to the Juniper um, when when changes happen. So we'd we'd created a a automation platform for our for our network with working with Juniper. Already. 
already. So we'd gone down some learning around how do we how do we how do we automate across multiple devices as far as pushing pushing end, end configuration out. So adapting the the you know part of the success for London too, we kind of set the criteria. It has to be fully automated because the scale and the number of components. So it has to be compatible with our automation platform from 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 day one. So that element didn't, you know, we'd already gone through that learning curve. What changed was how we actually test software. So, you know, you get you get a release of software. You need to lab test it. Um, it you know, do we test it in our lab? Do do EdgeCore test it in their lab in Taiwan? Do do IP Infusion test it in Bangalore? Um, and and we we kind of ended up doing a full test suite, which was a fully documented. 125-page you know, test suite, which was shared amongst all three teams, and then we, if if there were intermediate releases of software, we would then do sample testing, and we we effectively did a you know almost as if it was three three companies came together as one, and we just we just had a collab collaborative tool, um, a, a shared test set, and we we just worked through it and, and were very clear on the documentation. Uh, it took us probably you know it, it, resource wise it took us probably a little bit more than we we expected but we expected a slight ramp up in that so so um, big learning curve because you don't have the the comfort and facil facilities afforded you to by by say a Juniper or, or another um, company like that but um, but uh, you know. Uh, you know, and to answer your final question on the training, that then fed in because what we did was we rotated, even though we had three or four lead engineers that were on the project, when we got to the QA end of the software, we rotated other engineers from the wider team into that QA, QA process so that actually they learn about the whole the whole test and capability of the network. We also had an external trainer come in and give us a bespoke course on eVPN and, and think things like that. IP Infusion did some um, some 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 vendor specific training. EdgeCore did some vendor specific training. So it's it was multifunctional, but it was that rotation through the testing that I think really helped people to to cement the uh, uh, their knowledge. Hi, this is Paul Wagner from DT, uh, Donc, uh, a classical uh, legacy carrier. Uh, just one question from my understanding. Uh, uh, do I understand correctly that uh, for uh, the, the whole uh, LON2 network is uh, providing one layer 2 uh, reachability domain for all connected parts? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And uh, the other one is... Uh, Usually, if you talk about BGP, you're talking about route reflectors. So the, the maybe two, three, four, or something central points in a network where the whole uh, uh, the whole old TCP uh, sessions for the BGP, well, how would say the satellites uh, connected, uh, and they they give up their uh, uh, reachability the, the information to s a few central points. And then redistribute it to other in, in order to avoid a full uh, full mesh between all BGP uh, talking uh, members. Is that somewhere to to see here that there are no? I mean, at, at, at the moment, all of the all of the, the the endpoints are fully fully mesh. So so obviously, if it's just a tran if it's just a pass through and, and and it's it's not got any function in 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 the actual um, communication of EV, EVPN status. So, but all of the edge points will be fully meshed in this in this case. So there is scale in that, but that. That would be a design, design consideration as we grow the network. I mean, certainly, if we deployed this on the London One network, which is four or five times the size of this, then yes, we probably would go for a more traditional root reflector um, hierarchy. Maybe, maybe a you know a, a number of root reflectors redundancy across sites uh, for for key failure scenarios. But I think that's just a scale. At the moment, we don't see a, a scale issue on 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 the current design. Okay, thank you. One over here, one here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, <coughs> what was the main reason or the reasons to go for IP Fusion? What helped you to select that and not another operating system? Um, so. Uh, <laughs> It's a difficult one. I mean, at the time, um, so we we were working with EdgeCore, and, and EdgeCore had their own operating system that we that, that we tested and said, look, can, could we could could this scale? Um, and and in the same time, we probably talk, spoke with two or three other players that that were were, were developing and were were, were equally 
um, you know, happy to work with people like Edgecore. IP Infusion came up. Um, I think it was it was by chance. Um, my my lead architect was travelling to uh, to visit. I think Juniper at the time, or he was at a Nanog. Um, IP Infusion have a, 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 a centre in Santa Clara, so as well as developers in in that. So he he de detoured, um, did a bit of a deep dive with them around. You know, what do we need? Um, within two three weeks, they came back with a really great response about how they could adapt their 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 their, their ambition around their code development. Um, and and you know they were I guess they were keen they were they you know they they were as probably as good as somebody else, but they presented a really good 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 solution for us. There was a good relationship. They were keen to work in that kind of partnership engagement. So it, it you know there there wasn't a I guess maybe a lot of science to it. It, it felt right at the time. They, they, there was a good opportunity, um, and and you know the, the fact that they were working in harms in partnership with with Edgecore as well. Meant we felt there was strength in the, in that um, in, in in that system. Plus, they've got some history. You know, they're not they're not been around for five minutes. They've got a long history in providing software solutions, not into the enterprise, but certainly um, a history. So you think, well, look, you know, they're not going to maybe disappear tomorrow. So so you know that they they were the main thinking factors. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, another question. Just to understand your scale, uh, the routing table, which is the size of your routing table of the edge core devices today? So we don't hold, so this is this, the this thing, that, so the, 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 the routing table is, is really down to, is, is just device reachability. So we don't actually hold, so we, we run, um, on, on top of this, we run a thing called a root server. So the root server effectively, so we, we, this, would, this would support, this network would support peer-to-peer um, so if you, you've got an access network at one end of the network and a, a content network at the other end, they can join anywhere on, the, on, on our network and, th and then they create a, a, a bilateral peering session between themselves if they can reach agreement. And that, that will be completely transparent to us, that, that, that layer 3 BGP peering session. On this network, we also have a thing called a root server, which is kind of like a little bit like a root reflector, but it's, it's, it does a little bit more. So effectively, you can peer with the root server, and you can exchange prefixes to the, with the root server with everybody that's on there. So if there's four or five hundred people, you peer with the root server, you get you get access to peer with four or five hundred people. There are some participants on the exchange that um, don't want that open type of peering; they they want to negotiate. So so then. You know, depending on their status, you you might not reach them on the root server. You know, have to go and talk to them direct and things like that. So from that point of view, routing information is held on the root server or held at our customers' um, edge devices. The 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 routing table as such is really the the BG is is the MAC address reachability. So there's a single MAC address for every single customer that connects to it. So potentially 800 MAC addresses which are synchronized across the whole of the routing table, and that's essentially um, what what what's needed. Hi, um, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, you said uh, that th this uh, approach uh, gave you an enormous, uh, let's say, savings in capex and opex. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, is there can you give a ballpark percentage uh, compared to uh, a vendor solution? Um, yep. So absolutely. So we we went through a, a request. I won't tell you who we spoke to, but we went through and got a, a budget. Um, I, I we we. As I say, we've been live since June, so we've pretty much closed all of the reflective looking at the cost, and, and it was around about 60 to 65 percent saving in capital outlay of what we had from a traditional supplier to what we we spent on this project, and that is on the Sienna transmission equipment, the op optics for spine to leaf in, in, uh, interconnection, that's the OCNOS licenses and that's the edge core hardware and the support agreements around that. So so around about 65, 60 to 65 percent capital saving and I would say probably about 50 percent OPEX from a support and, and, and licensing point of view saving. Okay, and that uh, introduces my follow-up question because I was wondering because you're telling uh, in a normal case you would basically if you have problems you would call your vendor you pay, of course, a uh, very nice amount of maintenance support fee to towards them. But now you're already integrator, and you have to troubleshoot your own and coordinate with two. If you're uh, uh, unlucky, even with the chip vendors or three parties, how do you handle that? And doesn't that cost more money than the traditional uh, situation? It, yeah, I mean, it, you've got to be careful on on the cost. So, so how much do we do ourselves? Um, we probably. 
on, on fault finding, we probably don't do an awful lot more. I mean, even with Juniper, we pay for we pay for the advanced tax services and all, all of the all of the, the, the you know the heavy cost type of stuff because of the value of the network. On this one, we we you know we pay for what's called an enhanced support service with IP Infusion because when we first had this discussion, both Edgecore and IP Infusion had their basic support services which were to replace RMA in the case of Edgecore and, and, and their um, license, software license in the case of IP Infusion. Um, one of them had to take the lead in being the point of triage and so we went through a number of discussions and um, for now, it's, you know, say this is still, still an evolving ecosystem, we've, we've picked IP Infusion. So we do pay a small premium to IP Infusion to be the triage point. So if we get a fault that we can't fix, we'll call IP Infusion and their job is to say is this hardware or software. And then if it's hardware, it will then go off to RMA process with Edgecore. If it's software, they then drive the investigation and they've got a relationship with Broadcom. We also have a relationship with Broadcom, so if, uh, as do Edgecore, and so if everything you know, were to melt and there would be panic and, and, and alarms going off, we've got channels to, to go into the organisations at different areas. But the day-to-day the, the -day business process is it, it comes from IP Infusion. Um, believe me, IP Infusion's enhanced support service is a lot cheaper than uh, advanced tax services from Juniper, for sure. You know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi. So about the costs, I wonder because you compare the the the, fr the costs from the Juniper. You compare the setup as you would buy another heavy duty MX router and do MPLS versus the stuff with Edgecore. But have you actually asked Juniper to give you their price on eVPN setup with also Broadcom based uh, boxes? Yeah. I mean, I, I, as I say, I don't want to say who we were comparing it to. So I'm not comparing this to the incumbent London One network. So we actually went out to. To, to bid for a replacement of London 2 based on whatever technology the, the partner wanted to come, come to us with. So, you know, Juniper could um, could well have bid on that. They would probably have used a different, uh, to give you an idea, they would have used a different uh, platform, not the MX. Um, you, you know, so, so when I talk about 65% saving, it isn't against the incumbent Juniper, it's, ag it's against the bids for the London 2 replacement. We had O open compute bids. We had, you know, the the Aristas Huawei is the kind of the Broadcom rebadged, you know, type stuff, so, and we had the, the proprietary silicon manufacturers of, of switches. All three bid bid for that network. So that network, the comparison is between what was bid for the network and what was in in other areas. Okay, thanks. And just uh, another question. I wonder, usually you will get some support from the vendor, they will give you some design, some recommendations for your network to be built, and in the case of your solution, did you get any advice or every, everything was actually done by your engineering team or architectural team? Well, we, we didn't want to. We, we didn't want to make this. Obviously, we had an idea in our head of, of what would be the right architecture. So, but we didn't want to make that uh, absolute. So, when we put the request out, we actually wrote uh, a document which was a service requirement document based on outcomes rather than architecture. And we said to all of them, you know, come back with what you think is your your preferred architecture because we didn't want to force them into a, into the, the a design for us that wasn't right for them. Um, so so once we got through that first phase, it was a question of the, the, the in this case three companies sitting down and coming up with the design together um, based on recommendations. So there were some adjustments, and we you know we made a, a, you know some discussions about you know multi-slot sh chassis versus you know a top of rack type type single single uh, switch units. Um, but it was a collaborative approach once we got, but we, we definitely on the outset, we, we kind of said, look, you come back and tell us what your preferred solution is. Okay, thanks. So uh, I'm sure you'd like to sit back and relax in the success of this network, uh, but I'm wondering what the future, what you're looking at uh, going forward. And uh, specifically, you mentioned maybe chassis. Um, Octon has an open chassis. Uh, there's also, um, although not OCP, the telecom infrastructure project has packet optical switches, which we replace those green boxes, I think, quite nicely. And again, Acton Edgecore has a Cassini, and there's Voyager. I mean, what are you thinking? Uh, probably all of that. I mean, you know, there, there's only so much you can do at any one time. So we're we're, we're typically we're typically 
we'll have one eye on the future, so we do have research and, and development uh, time for our engineers to go through and talk to talk to the the edge cores and, and you know the the DCI providers. Um, Funny you mentioned the, the you know the DCI. There is there is an uplift project that's going to go in. So we are looking at you know we're going to look at you know different solutions and technologies for for that. I mean as far as the future, I think the main the main thing for us is that we we needed to prove this technology works. We needed to prove that it could scale. Um, you know yes, the cost of should we go for multi slot chassis versus sing single unit comes back to the number of fiber links, number of optics, you know, the cost of power and, and, and the, the whole manageability. Um, so we'll make that design change that, as, as scale grows. 400 gig, um, we typically, you know, the members, our customers will come to us and say, look, you know, we've invested in a, a 400 gig capable route and we want to, you know, we want to plug into you at that. So we, we, we have to react to that. And then, you know, going back to the Juniper story, you know, we still have investment in London One. Um, you know, we, we will challenge that, you know, how do we scale that? And it might be that Juniper respond to that. Maybe, you know, Juniper open up their system and, and Junos is more, more portable uh, across different, different vendors. You know, there, there could be a change in, in, in their strategy. And, and, and I think, you know, that's already part of their thinking anyway. So, so I mean, you know, I, I think this, this, you know, what we've learned over two years is that the, the ecosystem is changing, is still changing. And, and, and we, we kind of proved to this point we can, we can adopt it. Um, we'll we'll continue continue to monitor and take advantage of it really best we can. One one question on the hardware: Is there any perceived difference in quality when you look at the edge core hardware? Or were there any failures, any replacements necessary? Is it same quality? Then I mean, you have you have a long history of hardware. In, in the London Internet Exchange as well as Xtreme and, and all these vendors. I mean, I, I know it's a short time frame, but. It, it is a short time frame. And thank, thankfully, as I say, we, we haven't had a, a, a lot of failures. Um, I think most of the failures have actually been optics that, that, that are in, that plugged into the switches that are then not, not performing, and we've, we've had to swap them out. Um, so we haven't had a lot of failures, but you're right. I mean, the Extreme kit, um, which actually the Extreme kit isn't their own silicon; it's, it's Broadcom chipsets in there. Um, the Extreme kit has been very reliable for us. But one of the sort of selection processes we went through, obviously, I said to you how we did the interview with our membership back at 2016, and said, "Look, do, do you know what do you think about this solution?" Our, our members and people on our board are, you know, the BTs, the, 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 the Facebooks, the Amazons, they are our customers. So they were very, you know, the ones that we spoke to were also very good at giving us reference cases for, you know, what they use in their networks without going into any, end, you know, any, any NDA uh, breaches. But, you know, if, if, if they're participating and we're, we're open and talking to them about that. So we had a very good discussion with a number of members of our, our customers about what they use, their experience, and, and obviously one of the, one of the qualification processes was to talk to them, a few people about Edgecore and, and Acton and, and their product. And, and so, you know, one of the reasons to pick it is because we felt it was a reliable, well made, well manufactured, good history, uh, reliable product. And so far, I'm going to say it's been nine, nine months. Most of the stuff has been live for nine, ten months. It's been 100% production for six. And, and, and we, we ha we, we've had the performance we've expected. So it's been good. Sorry, uh, one more question. Uh, so you mentioned the ROS server. That's where you carry the full ROS that all, everybody uh, share the ROS. So I presume that's not running in this uh, system yet. The route server. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so it it will be connected in. It physically, uh, it will be connected in. But don't forget what it's doing is is it's got a whole you know whole bunch of compute, but it doesn't actually do much much from a, a traffic point of view. It 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 just manages B, BGP sessions and says for this prefix, you know, your next hop is here, and 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 so it maintains the the the, the, the prefix routing table. So it just it just acts as a yeah, as I say, like a little bit like a root reflector. It, it, yeah, it's, it's like a server that holds you know, multiple routing instances for the, for the, for the membership. Yeah. Uh, I have one question. Um, looking at the traditional situation that you are w we're working in a vendor uh, network, you basically with training your personnel, you would send everyone off to a vendor uh, training and certify them. In a new situation, uh, you already mentioned a bit of it in your presentation. How, how is the training done? What kind of knowledge do you need? Probably much lower and uh, 
stuff like that. Could you elaborate on that one? Yeah, I mean, it's... It, Did it, you actually need to hire more people uh, to uh, absorb all the knowledge or...? No, no, we didn't actually, we didn't hire any 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 people. Um, you know, we, we, we obviously deprioritize projects and, and move stuff around, but we didn't actually hire people for, for this specific role. We brought in a, an additional software developer to help us do the, um, the, the, the so some of the uh, automation elements of talking the, the netconf uh, and, and the templates that we build for the automation platform. But the network engineering element, we, we kind of just retrained our staff. Um, IP Infusion, we paid for a professional services engineer to be on site during the during the kind of the last bit of the design, build, and migration. Um, so he was one of their lead engineers. He and the team through um, web conferencing, we did a number of learning modules. So we we set you know these are the things we need to do. And part of the value that they brought was that they actually trained our staff via via either the on-site professional services person or the uh, the video uh, webinar type type approach. Um, our key is, the, you know, what we try and do is make sure when we train people that, you know, we retain them. I mean, the, probably the hardest thing is is retaining people. There's not a lot of training modules around eVPN um, or deployment of this situation. There's not a lot of white papers about this. This, so we were kind of like leading the way in that respect. So there was an element of just having to train your own staff because there wasn't anyone out there really to hire in. Yeah, there's some VXLAN experts, data center experts, but for this particular application, there wasn't a lot of people on the market. Okay, I think um, probably we should stop here okay. because we have lunch. <laughs> and so we'll break for lunch. Thank you very much, Thank Richard. You.